Okay, uh, thank you once again for joining. Uh, let's continue with the course, the local church. Uh, we've completed, uh, we, we're in section two, talking about God's blueprint. Uh, we've finished we finished looking at the local church as the body of Christ, as the family of God, as the pillar of truth, an army, the bride. And in the last class, we looked at the local church as the house of worship and prayer and the temple of God. Right? We've finished quite a few different uh, aspects or perspective of the local church. Uh, it's, if you notice that it's, it's just one blueprint, but uh, in total, there are 10 different perspectives. Right, it's one blueprint, but ten different perspectives. Okay, um, and each perspective is like a window that allows us to look into uh, the church from a different, uh, you know, aspect. Uh, for example, if this is, so if there's one blueprint for this room, uh, or if this is a much more bigger room, and if there are ten windows, uh, from every time you look from a different window you will have a different view of the same room, isn't it? So the person looking from there have, will have a different perspective of this room versus the person looking from this window into the room, isn't it? Um, so it's very important to have a different perspective, but it's all still the same room, right? It's still the same room. So it's one blueprint, but many different perspectives. And uh, for a healthy church, um, and for you as a pastor or as a leader to gauge how your church is doing, it's very important that you look through every single window. And you check, okay, how is this looking through this window, how, through this perspective? Is the church healthy through this perspective? Uh, how is it doing in, in, the, in, the, in the perspective of an army or as a bride? Do we have a congregation that is loving uh, the Lord, etc., etc.? Okay. Um, so what we will look at today is uh, chapter 15, the local church, Zion. God's chosen people. Okay, Zion. So uh, let's, uh, this is where we are starting off today. In your PDFs, we are on page 107. And uh, in your hard copy is 159. Yes. Thank you. So uh, let's start off by reading Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, verse 22 to 24. It says, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Okay. I want you to pay attention to those choices of words. Okay. Uh, yes, it's a scripture verse, but then play, please pay very close attention to the choice of words. It says, But you have come to Mount Zion. Okay. It's a mountain, Mount Zion, and to the city of of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirit of just men made perfect. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Okay, it's, it's just packed. Um, this scriptures are just super packed. Uh, you can just meditate on it for months. Uh, it's, it's so powerful. It's wonderful. Okay, so um, what, what, is, what, what is the scripture saying? What do you know about Zion? And, and it's... What is your understanding from the Old and the New Covenant? What is your understanding of Zion? People who are free, yeah. God's chosen people, yeah. It was in the old covenant, yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we look into that as well. Okay, so it's a very important point. It was a place of worship, 
um, and so it's very interesting that we we read from the book of Hebrews, isn't it? Hebrews is in the new covenant. And so it starts off by saying, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. It's talking about us, new believers. Everybody who believes right, in Jesus, who've accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior, now we are part of this heavenly citizenship. So the writer of the Hebrews, book of Hebrews, or the author is using the Old Testament terms to refer to us in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, okay? And so we look a little bit more deeper and to see how the church and us as people are connected, okay? Uh, let's look at the scripture, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Because here, in this passage, uh, Peter is referring to Zion as the church, okay? Um, somebody wants to read it or uh, should I read it? Let me check. First Peter chapter 2 verse 6. Therefore, it is also contained in the scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Okay, thank you. So therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. So therefore, again, every anytime you see therefore, you need to ask, why is it? Therefore. Okay, so you read all the previous scriptures for the context. Um, right, so therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. That means it is also written in the scripture. It says, behold, I lay in Zion. So, yeah, Zion, Zion, whatever. Okay, Zion. It's a pronoun, so it's okay. <laughs> Um, it says, I lay in Zion. What does that mean? I lay in Zion. This is just another word for dwell. Right? I dwell in Zion. That's where it's, I'm, I, Zion is my resting place. It's my dwelling place. Right? Um, so he's saying, behold, I, in other words, if we have to replace the word lay, I dwell in Zion, a chief cornerstone elect precious and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame okay so as zion we are the chosen people of god uh, again let's look at the old covenant the old testament um people so it, it was a place mount zion it is a mountain it was close to jerusalem uh and so so later uh, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but uh, it's okay. Let's make that point. Um, there was this region, this mount region was a stronghold of a clan or a tribe called Jebusites. Uh, uh, you know, they, they were like the Canaanites right, who were part of that. Clan. And um, it was a stronghold. It was not just a pe uh, place. Now, a stronghold is like a fort, right? So uh, we say, okay, don't let the enemy have a stronghold in your life. Or the enemy has a stronghold in your life. That means he has a stronghold. That's what it is. And so anytime an army has a stronghold of a place, that means it is impossible for the other opposition army to penetrate. Because it's a very important place militarily. So if that is lost, though everything else is lost. And so this tribe of the Canaanites called the Jebusites, uh, were, it was a stronghold for them, Zion. Yeah. And so David defeats them later on, and he captures them. And then later on, uh, so Jerusalem was a city that was close to Mount Zion. And then later, Zion and the city of Jerusalem was later known as the city of David. Geographically, the whole zone was called as a city of David. We all know that, right? And then I think so, uh, in the previous classes, we looked at from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, are uh, the song uh, Psalms. If you see the title, it will say Songs of Ascent. Ascent is simply but ascending. Ascending order is you're going up, isn't it? Uh, songs of Ascent. So I'm sure there were more Psalms, but only 14 are titled as Songs of Ascent from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. So those were the songs that they would sing as they would ascend up the hill of the Lord. Right? The psalmist says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Those with clean hands and pure heart. You get what I'm saying, right? So now, you see, now it's it was 
which started off as just a physical or a geographical place later the people in the old covenant were also be, uh, became to know as the people of zion as in simply means it simply means god's chosen people and so god dwells in zion that means he lays in zion means that he is in the midst of his chosen people psalm 22 verse 3 he is in the midst of the praises of his people it's it's it's, it's that simple right and so peter is using the old covenant terms to refer to the church and the new believers in the new covenant are you all following yes no maybe yeah okay it's very interesting it's uh, it's beautiful this this is uh, again this like i said there are 10 different perspectives one blueprint and each perspective is so beautiful uh it's it's amazing to see and when we see that the church was god's idea and we are getting a sneak peek into his idea isn't it and see how beautifully he's thought is designed for his church to be a church as an army as a church as the temple of god as a house of prayer and worship as 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 a bride as a vine and the branches as a lampstand which we will learn he so beautifully carefully thought about how his church should be okay let's read some more scriptures um so as zion we are the chosen people of god we are a nation of holy people who are priests unto god which is mentioned in first peter chapter 2 verse 9 to 12 but you are a chosen generation how many times have you read the scriptures guys <laughs> okay we read it multiple times uh, so please remember the scripture by heart <laughs> okay first peter chapter 2 i always get it wrong again like i said no it's okay is it second peter chapter 2 or is it first peter chapter 2 uh cuz i know it's in my bible it's on the <laughs> left side page or the bottom uh, top right so that's how i remember it uh and so you give me a new bible i'd be like oh lord <laughs> Okay so first Peter chapter 2 verse 9 to 12 but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light this glorious this glorious this verse you are a chosen generation that means you've been chosen out of darkness you are special and this is connected with exodus 19 in the old covenant right when you look at exodus 19 god says you yourself have seen how i brought you out of egypt on eagles wings god says i brought you unto myself he says right so what israel goes through in the old covenant is an image of who we are in the new covenant it's as simple as that right from the passover everything right um so we celebrate passover now they celebrate passover then passover is what passing over right then in in exodus when you read the angel of death passed over any house that saw the blood right it's so very interesting you see that it didn't matter so if you put the blood on the outside of this door post that we have here outside the angel of death when they passed by it didn't matter who was inside you could have been an egyptian it didn't matter it didn't matter if you were worthy it didn't matter if you believed in the one true god it didn't matter all of that as long as you were behind the blood or covered by the blood and that's who we are in jesus isn't it right it is his blood he is our righteousness right our, our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags that's what the bible says isn't it uh, and so it says we've been chosen a royal priesthood uh, all of those words require a, a word study <laughs> a holy nation the same words again guys i would like, encourage you to read exodus 19 because god's heart originally was for the entire nation of israel to be priests right and then it all the situation circumstances led to a levitical priest uh, only the tribe of levites would be the priesthood but all of the changes in the new covenant right a royal priesthood a holy nation his own special people 
you were called out of darkness. That means you were set free, you were delivered, you were redeemed. For what? That you may proclaim the praises of him. So you were, you were not set free to run around like headless chickens. <laughs> you know, okay, you're free, go do whatever you want to do. You know, no bondage, no more shackles. <laughs> okay, but we were set free, we were redeemed, to, that we may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, okay? And who, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. Verse 10, it's very important, okay? So who once were not a people, that means you, we were orphaned in the light of the new covenant. We had no inheritance. We were orphaned. We were orphaned to die. But now we are the people of God. Zion, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So as a people of God, we obtain mercy. As a people of God, we are chosen, we are special, we are royal priesthood, we are a holy nation. Beloved, verse 11, it says, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that... When they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Okay, so again, just revisiting the couple of scriptures, we are chosen, we are set apart. Basically, that's what it is. We are a holy nation. And verse 11 confirms that. It says, abstain from fleshly lust. Our flesh loves lust. Our flesh loves sin. That is the fallen nature of our flesh. It's corrupted. Right? Corinthians, she says it's corrupted and it's mortal. That then the time will come where we will be, our body will be incorruptible, our body will be uh, immortal. Right? Paul writes. It says abstain from fleshly lust. That means just strive to live a holy life. With everything that we have, know that we've been called out. Know that uh, things things that are okay to the world is not okay to us as a church. The standards set by the world are not the standards for the church or for a Christian. Are you all with me? Okay. Uh, listen, I know we've all heard this many times, so many times. Uh, we all know this. This is not a Sunday school thing, right? From or at least from the time we were in Sunday school, we've heard this. Be a good boy. Be a good girl. Uh, all of that, you know. Um, but a living a holy life, when we say holiness, the only immediate uh, our immediate thought is moral purity. Okay, if I if I were to ask you, what do you think of holy? Is okay, um, not sinning. It, not sinning is so general. <laughs> uh, okay, um, not lying not stealing, not committing murder, not committing sexual immorality, not committing this, not committing that. Those are the things that we will immediately think of when we, when we say, okay, holiness or holy, isn't it? And all of that is partially right. Moral purity comes under that. But those are all part of righteousness as well. And so when we say God is holy, what does that mean? Does that mean that God is only morally pure? No. It's not, the question is not that he does not sin or he does not lie or he does not steal. He cannot sin. His, his holiness transcends the logic uh, or understanding of moral purity. Okay, good catch. Are you with me? And so that's what we are striving for and we are encouraging, uh, we are being encouraged by Peter. Uh, as his people, as his people who've been called out, as his chosen people, strive for living a holy life. And that can only happen by us looking at the one who is holy. We cannot look at the world and say, okay, I'm going to, look, I'm going to live a holy life because the world is sinful. Yeah, that's the beginning of understanding, okay, the world is sinful, but that doesn't mean you can live a holy life just because with that understanding. 
you become holy you start to live a holy life by looking at the one who is holy you following yes no okay all right okay and it is the holy spirit that empowers us that gives us the strength to live a holy life um the spirit of the living god uh what's his first name holy right he is the one who empowers us to give you know to uh live a, a life of holiness because uh, and i i say this from personal experience uh so now you may look at me as a worship leader or as a pastor or as a teacher etc etc um i've had my fair shares of addictions uh and you know and i remember saying okay lord today is the last i'm going to be a different person from tomorrow two days later i'm back to square one it's like snake and ladders you know right i'm going to try i'm going to try i'm going to try i'm going to try not thinking about it i'm going to try step one step two step three to overcome this addiction but in our own strength we cannot overcome in our own strength overcome comes with complete surrender to the holy spirit so when you completely absolute surrender right we make that declaration every day you guys make it every day here at bc what is the last line of the declaration to him i am in absolute surrender and so our overcoming or a a start to living a holy life begins there is living a life of absolute surrender it's as simple as that okay are you all uh, with me all right let's move on so we've been learning about zion and how zion is simply means god's chosen people and what we looked at about david capturing um the um the land the mount zion is mentioned in the notes there um so zion is a name often used as a synonym for jerusalem the word is first found in second samuel chapter 5 verse 7 um you know commonly referred to a specific mountain near jerusalem which is mount zion on which stood a jebusite fortress and this is what david killed okay i'm just uh, you know reemphasizing what what i what i've just narrated to you and uh, go through all of those scriptures that's mentioned in the notes from first kings 8 from first chronicles to second chronicles um i love the old testament it's beautiful it's awesome um i guess it's more story like and more history it's wonderful but you need to understand the old to uh, understand the new right we um people during bible times understood that and so um david captures that and then solomon later builds the temple in jerusalem and zion expanded and that that's that's where the first temple was built again you know the mount zion uh all scriptures mentioned there talks about it and so in the new covenant this is who we are we are god's chosen people we come under the banner of zion uh you know some of the radical people uh, in jewish people nowadays are known as zionists <laughs> you get the idea right okay so we looked at uh the hebrew word Uh, sorry hebrews chapter 12 was 22 to 23 we read that in the very beginning okay so uh in the new testament the church of the first born the heavenly jerusalem is referred to as zion that is you and me so why 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 all this uh why all this importance of zion or a fortress now is the stronghold has shifted hands stronghold which was once the stronghold for the jebusites is now the stronghold for the israelites right and now it's no longer a place of just a military thing like in the natural but it's a place where god dwells right it's it's a place where god dwells it's his resting place it's the place where his presence is hosted it was a place of corporate worship and uh, it was magnificent and uh, it, it was a huge joy every time when people's like some says i was glad when they said to me come let us go to the house of the lord and so one of the darkest days in the history of israel is when the first temple was destroyed for the first time 
the Babylonians invaded and destroyed the Temple of Solomon, and then they take they are gone into exile for seventy odd years. Now, the one place, see, as human beings, historically we relate to a physical place. I'll tell you why. Okay. And let's meet for coffee. We say that no. It's like, hey, can we meet for coffee? Um, coffee is the least bit of our interest. <laughs> Isn't it? It's, we are not really meeting to have a cup of coffee. The point is to meet and have a conversation. Right? But the place we can relate to is like, hey, you know, the coffee day there, or you, you know, this uh, Thalassery over here, you know, everybody knows Thalassery, right? Uh, every road has one. Uh, so you, uh, you know, it, it's the same. And I used to, I did this study when I was uh, doing youth ministry is that young people as well they connect to a physical location a physical space okay for example like when i was a teenager when i was part of the youth uh, you know growing up um if say church means it was a place where we met to play football or okay hey, that space or you know if this is where we hung out it was in the church and so young people connect to a physical location it is not about the location it is a because it's a, but it's a common meeting place like, hey, you remember this is where we used to meet? You remember this bakery that was there, which got destroyed later? You, it's very, it immediately makes you feel very nostalgic, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, you, you know, <laughs> uh, if I have to take my son around to the school that I studied in, which does not look like anything like how beautiful it was, because uh, apartments have come, and and just saying, this is where Dad, I used to study. Uh, there's a catch to it, isn't it? And so the Temple of God was a place like that for the people of Israel. Simply because God dwelt there. And that's why all this talk about Zion and the importance of it and this perspective of it. Okay. So the first point there it talks about in page 108 in your PDFs, it talks about God dwells. And if he's dwelling, wherever he dwells, he rules from there. Isn't it? Right? God dwells and rules in Zion, it says. Um, so Zechariah chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Now again, look at the reference there. O daughter of Zion, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst. So <laughs> he's saying, you are my chosen people. People are also called Zion, and the place is also called Zion. Okay. Um, Psalm, 8, Psalm 2, verse 6 and 8, it says, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. So, wherever God dwells, his kingdom is there. King never comes without his uh, kingdom. There is no king. You will not be a king if you don't have a kingdom. Right? Kingdom is two different words. King and dominion. Right? It's two words coming together. Um, and so if the king is present, and we're talking about king of all kings in this place, that means his kingdom is present. And wherever his kingdom is, that means there is rulership. Right, there's rulership in that region. Uh, so he dwells wherever God dwells, he reigns from that place. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is the throne room of God, right? In Revelation, so again, if you were to go to a palace, it has multiple rooms. One of the rooms is the throne room, right? And, and it is in the throne room where you get the audience with the king. It is in that room. In olden days, it was called as the room of the presence or the room of the face. So when we say face to face, it, lit it, it literally means his presence was so strong and intimate there. Uh, and so it was in the throne room where all the political decisions were made. Uh, okay, you know, this is what we're going to do for our country. This is what we're not going to do for our country. This is what we're going to do for our people, etc., etc. It was in the throne room, right? The authority, the reigning uh, of the king is displayed in that room, isn't it? Because he is there, the king is there. And so now in, the, in our context, when we look at that God dwells and rules among his people. And Psalm, that Psalm 2, what we just read, says, You are my son, 
I have begotten you. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. Now only a ruler or a king can do that. Isn't it? If, you have, if you're going to give something to uh, someone, you have to own it, isn't it? <laughs> right? I can't take Rin's phone and say, okay, from today it's not your, no longer Rin's phone, it's Anand's phone. I don't own it, isn't it? Right, no? Right. <laughs> okay, so he's saying, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. He's not just talking about something small here. It's not just a nation, it's nations, right? <laughs> very, very important for your inheritance. Uh, and so we, we, we see that, uh, you know, his his stamp of authority uh, is, uh, you know, is, is emphasized in these scriptures. So God dwells and rules in Zion. And out of Zion, God shines. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> Right, uh, Psalm 50, verse 1 and 2, it says, The mighty one, God the Lord, Adonai, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Now, sun shines, as it, sun is shining right now, uh, and the light comes all the way to us. It takes eight minutes for the light to reach from sun to earth. Eight minutes, right? Uh, and the light is traveling at the speed of 300,000 kilometers per second per second. And so, uh, in like that, the light travels across the globe seven times a second. So light travels quite a distance. Right, so the sun, the light from the sun is traveling quite a distance at quite a pace, isn't it? It brings us light, everything. It makes everything bright. But where is it shining the most? Closer to the sun core. That's where it's the raw power of the sun is felt there, isn't it? Yes or no? So the light can go travel far away. It shines. It shines far. But it's the most strongest and the most brightest at its core, at its source. Heaven needs no sun because the light of his face lights up all of heaven. Okay. So out of Zion, he shines. And uh, out of Zion, there is deliverance. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17, verse 21. Obadiah is a book in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite book? Obadiah. <laughs> Who says that? Okay, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17 and verse 21. It says, But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. There shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. Okay, the language is so beautiful, poetic. Uh, then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. The kingdom shall be the Lord's. Okay, so coming to judge the mountains of Esau, again in the Old Covenant, uh, the, I mentioned this, there are only two kinds of people in the Old Covenant. People in the Covenant and people outside of the Covenant. Okay, And so Esau, again, represented the enemy, the Canaanites, the enemy of Israel, enemy against God's chosen people, etc. He's saying the time is coming where the people of God will judge the enemies of God. That's that's uh, painted in the image as mountains of Esau. Right? Every mountain will be made low. Every valley will be made straight. So. so deliverance and holiness will be in Zion uh, among the people of God. God's people will possess their possessions. The deliverers that God raises up from uh, upon Mount Zion will have rule over the unsaved and ungodly. And so now we are the chosen people of God. Right? Uh, God, The king, our king, dwells among us. And we've been given a commission. And so ask this to make that prayer. Let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Carry out our great commission. That's what we've been told to. And in other words, that's what it's saying is that, okay, you are in my kingdom now. You are my chosen people. Um, 
Don't just sit and warm the couch. Go out, evangelize, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Why? Because there's deliverance. Because he's delivered us, he expects us to go and do the same. So there's deliverance on Mount Zion. The Lord roars from Zion. Okay, what's the significance of roar? What what language is being used there over there? Lion roars. Yeah, mighty. Yeah. This is stamping saying, I'm present here. This is my area. The area boys, we say, no? Have you ever had any school fights? I've been part of many school fights. In school fights, okay, it's just a, it's a long time ago. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's like, hey, you're coming to my area. Uh, it's like that, you know, this is my area. Okay, call the area boys, dude. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, yeah, it's hilarious. Why do we use flags? You know, we, there was this question that was asked, right? To uh, what's the significance of using flag in worship? Right uh, now, everything has a flag these days, right? From the countries to the political parties to other parties, uh, it 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 represents who they are, and they want to stamp their authority of that region or declare who is reigning. And so in worship, when we use flags and we use different colors and each color signifies something, but basically we are just saying that, okay, our king is in this place. This region belongs to him. We're just declaring that. Right? And uh, it's been there. It's, flags is an ancient idea. Uh, even around the tabernacle of Moses, uh, there were three tribes, north, south, east, and west. And each three tribes uh, had one lead tribe. So, for example, uh, under the, so there's, one, I think, the east section, there was a tribe of Judah and there's two other tribes, I think Benjamin and something else. And the main flag, the symbol of their flag was the lion. And so each, re, uh, the other three tribes had a flag, one had a ox, eagle, and a man. And you suddenly begin to wonder, okay, hey, I've seen all those symbols somewhere. You know, Ezekiel 1, Revelation 4, you see that, isn't it? So, nothing is mentioned in the Bible as coincidence, guys. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, when it says the Lord roars from Zion, he's simply, again, stamping his authority, who reigns in the region, uh, saying that who is the king. So, Joel 3.16, the Lord also will roar from Zion, and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. He will show forth his strength from among his people. Okay, that's a very important point there. You can highlight it if you can. Um, he will show forth his strength from among his people. There's a, how many of you know this worship leader called Ron Canoli? Ron Canoli? Oh, Lord. Okay, okay, seriously? Okay, oh my gosh, this generation, I tell you. Uh, Lord, give me patience right now. <laughs> Ancient of this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ancient of this. Bless and honor. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Oh, this is like a dagger through my heart. Like, you know, seriously. It doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it. Did I ask a question? Uh, I don't like the song. <laughs> In the 90s, you go back, uh, as in there were just f very few movements or worship moments, like Integrity Music, which was part of Ron Canoli, Don Moen, um, Hosanna Music. There were Vineyard Music. They were huge, right? And so Ron Canoli has a song called Joshua Generation. Uh, you have to listen to it when you can. And uh, have you heard of this Paul, uh, Paul Wilbur? Thank you, you know. Paul Wilbur, I enter the holy of holies. 
What's up, bro? It's an insult. Imagine you write a book. I say, it's like, oh, I know that book, but I don't know the author. So insulting. <laughs> so? 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 Kim's are also old. Do <laughs> Sorry, those online. I'm just taking a little bit of a history class here in worship. Okay, um, so he roars from Zion. Uh, I mentioned about Paul Wilbur because uh, he has a song called a Roar from Zion. Um, I'll play it at the break time. <laughs> okay, um, so next section talks about releasing the rod of his strength. Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. It uh, talks about the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. I will make your enemies my your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Uh, another word for the, the rod over there in other translations you might see is scepter. Right? A scepter is like, uh, again, you have all these kings rule with a scepter, right? And if uh, if you have the software called eSword, um, and if you look at all the cross references of all the Bible script verses that has these word scepter, you'll understand the log uh, the context of all of this. So it it's again stamping uh, your mark of authority. And so when it says releasing the rod of his strength, it's just talking about his uh, his authority there. Okay. Are you all with me? Okay. So practical ways a local church can implement this. Uh, as, as God's own people, every local church must raise up a people who represent or represent kingdom culture and values in this world. Every local church must raise up. Okay? And every local church must raise up a people who are holy, sanctified, and living, transformed lives. This is the first way of how we can implement this. And call to show forth his praises. Every local church must raise up a people who are Proclaiming the praises of the one who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Call to see his kingdom come. Every local church must raise up a people who walk in kingdom power, authority, and dominion. And all of these seem so basic and fundamental, isn't it? Like, okay, encourage everybody to be worshippers. Encourage everybody to pray. Encourage everybody to live in a kingdom culture life. It's so fundamental. And that's why it's fundamental. It's, it's foundation it's important uh, right so challenges to be prepared for there will be resistance earlier on very earlier on in this course we learned that people will resist change status quo christianity will resist this kind of lifestyle i'll pray for the ipad uh, later on friends status quo christianity will resist this kind of lifestyle what does that mean it's like, oh, do we really need to live a life like this? Isn't it not enough if we go to church on Sunday morning? I'm being a good person. I donate charity to the NGOs and all of that. All of this, is this all, isn't it too much? Isn't it too deep? There will be some sort of, you know, status quo Christianity kind of thing. But as pastors and as leaders, it is up to us to emphasize and to teach uh, and encourage people to live in uh, kingdom values and, and culture. All cool? All right. All right. We'll pause here. We'll take a break. We'll come back. <laughs>